I'm here with the writer Marcus Chow. We've just been watching the film about the, basically the privatisation of the NHS as a long-term strategy over a period of at least two decades. Uh, what do you feel about that film, Marcus? Well, this film said what I've known for a long, long time. Um, that it, in 2012, the, the government removed its duty to provide healthcare to you and your children, something which is incredibly astonishing. And, and, and it's remarkable that our media have not told people that the, the foundation stone of our, of our NHS was actually removed. So uh, it, is, it is shocking. It is quite shocking. And, and obviously one of the questions that kept rising in there was, is this a, an ideology taking place here? Or is it just about sorting out their mates, etc.? What was your personal feelings about the... Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about such a mass, wide-scale change yes. of the actual face of the NHS. So it's an ideology. I right. mean, the NHS is one of the fairest, most cost-effective and efficient health services in the world. Uh, countless comparisons, international comparisons, show that the NHS is one of the top two uh, systems in health systems in the world for patients. Um, but this ideology is to, to privatise everything, to sell it off. Right. Um, at, at, at any cost, and in fact, um, uh, the, the John Redwood and uh, Oliver Letwin wrote a book called Privatising the World a few years ago, and this is the Bible that they're actually using to do this. And, and the end game uh, will be a, an insurance-based system like the American system. Indeed. And the American system is twice as expensive per capita as the British system. With the Americans have a lower uh, life expectancy than British people, they have higher infant mortality, and 40 or 50 million people don't have any health care. So this is the model that we're moving to, but no government would remove the NHS overnight, they would, ne they would not dare to. So what's ha happening is it's being removed gradually by stealth, while the government is saying all the time, we are not selling off the NHS. Right. And, and the media, for reasons I really don't understand, are failing people and not telling them that, that this is happening. So when you do tell people what's happening, uh, they don't believe you. I mean, things are happening that are so shocking. I mean, for instance, does any, do, do most people know that our blood plasma was sold to an American asset stripping company six months ago? The company is called Bain Capital. It's owned by Mitt Romney. Uh, its job is to cut up uh, companies and sell off the pieces. So my question is, how can David Cameron guarantee the safety of our blood products against uh, HIV, CJD, hepatitis and things like this. When you tell people these things, they can't believe that it's happened and they cannot believe that the media, including the BBC, has not told them. Yes, it's a very compliant press, isn't it? I mean, from yeah. looking inside of what's taking place, I know what it's like when I've gone and I said, are we, are we all aware of this, of this destruction, yeah. this wholesale dismantling? And I have to say, to give them credit, Sunday Express did let me, commission me to write about the fact that MPs and Lords have... Um, uh, financial links with private healthcare yes. companies, 206 I think it was roughly at the last count, certainly right. over 200. And so, you know, that, that was great, that was great to be able to get that, but generally it's sort of a blanket like, okay, no, this can't, this is all conspiracy theory taking place here, it's that Well, I mean, sense, what, what the greatest weapon that the government has is the disbelief of people. Right. So, for instance, in 2010, the NHS had its highest ever uh, uh, sat satisfaction rating by people. Okay, so people really love the NHS. Uh, they believe that it, 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 you know, they're proud of the NHS. You know, it, it makes them feel proud to be British. They can't quite believe that any government would really remove the NHS. Right. And so this is the greatest weapon that David Cameron has. He's removing it, and people cannot believe that, that it's actually happening. Right, but you know, as that film so rightly points out, this is way beyond David Cameron. This is a long-term strategy. Yes. It's coming from all over yes. the world. It's a global issue. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the greatest threat really to the NHS is an EU-US free trade agreement. On the one hand, uh, David Cameron says he wants to pull back powers from the EU. But actually, he's pushing to have the NHS at the mercy of this treaty. And what this treaty will do is it will open up the NHS to carve up by American health companies. But even worse than that, what it actually does is it, is it locks in privatisation. So it enables uh, international companies to look at the NHS and say, well, you haven't privatised it, I can't make money out of it, I'm going to sue you for future earnings unless you do that. So what it actually says is that whether privatisation is good or bad, and I, I think it's clearly bad, there's no evidence that it's good, but whether it's good or bad, it will be locked in forever by this treaty, completely subverting our democracy.
I'm here with Peter Bark, who is, well, everything to do with this NHS film that we've just watched. The director, the producer, the editor, the interviewer, the presenter, pretty much everything. What inspired you, what motivated you to do that, Peter? Well, by doing it all myself, all the faults are my own, but what inspired me to do it was really uh, one or two doctors who invited me on a snowy day in London down the stone steps to a basement in uh, Earl's Court. And uh, I really didn't know what to expect, but they knew I was a filmmaker. My last film had been about a dying artist, so that was really, in many ways, uh, unrelatable to what they wanted to discuss, which was the dismantlement, abolition of their NHS, and an overwhelming, almost drowning sensation that nobody was telling this story, and they could not believe that. And they had an ambition to persuade me that it was a story worthy of a film. So I came out of that meeting wanting very much to make a film and out of the second meeting realized the, realizing the enormity of the task and how I was not an expert in this. But then I worked out how I should approach it two ways. One is make them the doctors and me the patient, which is the public. Make me the public. So as you see, it's filmed very tight on the doctors, like you're in a, a doctor's room and they're giving you the diagnosis. intimacy about it. And it is a very sort of bad news they're giving you too. It's that dreaded conversation with the doctor. So there was that. And then overcoming my ignorance was realising ignorance is not a bad thing. This is the problem with what is happening, is our ignorance. So rather than affect great knowledge, I was quite happy and comfortable using the film as a platform through which to learn about what is going on. And of course I was, in that instance, shocked swiftly. Well, and it is shocking, isn't it? And this is one of the problems that we have in being able to convey that to the public, because the public just can't believe that such corruption would be taking place, because that's ultimately what it is, really, and I think that really is pretty much the conclusion of your film in many key yes. regards, isn't it? I think it is. In fact, I was struck by your awareness of that when I met you, and I'm very grateful that you, know, you, you are, are noticing the importance of this subject matter, because it becomes something other than, you know... Um, one's career as, in, as a filmmaker or anything like that, it becomes almost a public interest and we, I feel, by keeping the subject alive, if it is not too late, are doing a public duty, a kind of a service, which is curiously absent in mainstream media. Yes. I know there are one or two people, I know you're an exception to that rule yourself in your ambitions to talk about these sorts of issues, but it, but it is a curious absence and it doesn't mean the subject goes away. I will continue harking on in the darkness and uh, um, uh, hoping people through seeing the film, however it is shown, will feel a reaction that makes them put pressure on their GPs, on their MPs, on their councillors, on their media. I mean, that was the other thing as well as obviously, as you say, they're delivering a lot of dark news, these doctors, to us. But I also found lots of it very hopeful and That's optimistic. And that is, so. we can do something, actually, because the whole issue of the state's responsibility to patient care. That really is, as one of the doctors said quite clearly, that's just about introducing a new statute, a new law, to, to, to really undo what's the damage and destruction that's already been done. It's not, it shouldn't be that difficult. The problem, of course, is if this is about an ideology, which is beyond and above just a, a separate political party, and I think you fall down very much on the side that it is an ideology that's taking place. Am I, is that correct? It is correct, and I surprise myself even now uh, saying that because a year ago I would have viewed the sorts of opinions that I now have quite clearly in my own mind as conspiratorial and, and a bit impressionable and naive and uh, but no I've become the person I used to frown at slightly from afar who spoke about you know people are really doing this because of that and I would say no that's not true but the evidence and the film is very much an evidence-based film there is the quietude, if you like, solitude of me making it alone, but there's also the, the company of, of, uh, of, of what is taking place that, that is, is, is pretty sort of what is bad news.
Yes. So Max, yes. we're here at the screening about basically the, the wholesale destruction of the NHS. How did that impact you? Well, it's another example of junk economics. The, the idea that the NHS and selling it off makes good economic sense is hogwash. It makes no sense. You know, it's interesting. We live in a, a year when the government is simultaneously renationalizing the Royal Bank of Scotland, and they've been proven to be extraordinarily uh, corrupt while they are selling off pieces of the NHS, which has done remarkable good. So they're getting rid of a good thing by selling it off to privateers and profiteers to fund the renationalization or the continued funding of known scallywags right. over at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Right. So this is junk economics, and uh, this film, I think, really captures the heart and soul of the people uh, who are affected by this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You can really feel it. The film bleeds. Yes, I agree with you. And one of the questions that, that is presented in there is why has the media been so sort of reluctant to cover the whole issue of it? Obviously, as somebody who works in the media, what, what, how would you respond to that? I think the media is part and parcel of a overall corruption by the same group of outside consultants who are brought in as hired guns to fund re-election campaigns, to reorganize uh, these institutions like the NHS or the Royal Mail just came out of an enormous scandal where Vince Campbell allowed for an eight million pound fee to be paid to the lead banker for gaming that IPO and they're not even demanding any kind of clawback or anything. And this is uh, endemic in the US and the UK all around the world. The same group of consultants, the same group of uh, accountants, you know, that we know the names, the KPMGs, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Dwayne Two, Ernst & Young. These are the four horsemen of the accounting apocalypse and they're all over the world doing the same kind of thing. And they are obviously influencing our compliant media. Absolutely. They are completely compliant in the media as the media finds itself under financial pressure and uh, they, they seek consultation with these groups and before you know it they've been sucked into the same kind of uh, larceny and duplicity and uh, junk economics. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Sure. That's And obviously, I understand about compliant media, I understand those issues. But from your perspective, you've clearly tried many avenues to try and get the word out. Mm. And do you feel in any way that you may have been blocked? That there may be some sort of, you know, challenges that we can't necessarily see, you know, other forces that are stopping this essential message getting out? Well, in my CCG, I have a long track record of trying to get these issues discussed amongst the GP community locally in um, Bexley, that's where I am. I've made proposals to the CCG, the commis commissioning group, and I've, I've asked them, can I have half an hour at the end of our group meetings, which happen every three months, just to talk to the GPs. We're all very busy, it's very hard to get GPs together in, in, in one room at the same time. Could I have this opportunity to speak to them? This has been blocked time and time again. The disappointing thing is, um, also, the medical bodies, such as the, our local LMC, have also saw fit to not allow me to have these public meetings. In fact, in January last year, I approached GPs and I, I asked them would they like to know more about the big picture stuff instead of uh, just focusing on local issues all the time. Do they want to be informed about the impact of these changes? Because public knowledge and GP knowledge is, is, is sort of formed by watching the mainstream news and the media. So. I felt it was important to, um, in order to get them on side, they need to be informed, and I think that's what I wanted to try and help with. Um, so I got a petition together. I've got 40 GP signatures, which is more than m half the GPs in our area, or close to, um, which is nearly everybody I'd asked. Only one or two people didn't want to, to sign the petition. And I took that to my LMC, and I said, look, there's an appetite uh, for people wanting to be informed. Can you sponsor a meeting? If it's done under the heading of the LMC, then people will come. Didn't happen. So block, block, and uh, right. uh, you know, time and time again, it's not happened. So and I've, I've what taken. What is that about? Is that is that about people just worried about securing their own positions, or is it more than that? I'm not sure what it is um, because you know we we supposedly live in, a, live in an open liberal democracy. Well, they don't have to agree with me, but at least 
give an airing to the opposing view of what we're being presented. Mm -hmm. uh, I get the feeling whenever I, whenever I go to a CCG meeting and we have these GP engagement events, we're just subject to spin. Yeah. We are told, for example, uh, quite recently, re relating to the closure of Lewisham A&E, that somehow by closing hospital departments and having fewer beds, this will lead to improved patient care. Right. So, you know, you have to pinch yourself and see there are other GP colleagues trying to persuade you of something that there's no evidence for. Right. It's very difficult. It is. And if you keep hearing these same... Same lies. Same, same lines, yeah, and lies, and you keep... They gain a power. Of course they gain. They started off as a lie and they remain a lie, but actually the... The power of the lie is diminished and you start to doubt yourself, you start to doubt your own thinking capacity and you start to say, well maybe there's something in what they say, surely they won't be saying this without any evidence. But unless you know the big picture, unless you know there's a deliberate <coughs> attack on the NHS, then you will not keep to your original thoughts and that opposition that's there is soon stifled out. Just one final thing, and that is, I, I mean, I went through different moods watching that film, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there was a moment when I felt really despondent, mm -hmm. and another moment when I felt quite jubilant, when one of the doctors was saying, actually, there are ways, there are ways through this. But what's the sort of the remaining feeling for you? Do you feel that sort of all is lost, or there's still hope? Or No, there, there's always hope. My, my sort of driving uh, thought is, Politicians are striving so hard to stop the public knowing what's going on. That has to be our best ammunition against what's going on, to inform the public. Otherwise, why would they bend over backwards to hide and obscure what's really going on? So I think when there's a mass public awakening to this gross betrayal of their interest, yes. that can be the only solution. That would be just amazing. There's no point doctors amongst themselves talking and uh, bemoaning the loss of the NHS. We need to get out there and tell the public. The public need to rally around the profession who's being systematically intimidated and bullied, and I have many examples of this, uh, into silence. So if you do have the courage to speak up, you find out you're sacrificing your career and your livelihood. Right. right. Um, that know, hasn't stopped you? It hasn't stopped me because I've reached a point whereby it doesn't really matter anymore because the way things are going, it's not the sort of world of medicine I relatively right. look forward to practicing in. Right. Because my relationship with the patient will be contaminated. I will no longer be able to tell them what I think is in their best interest. I will have the CCG and whoever replaces the CCG, the private companies, telling me how to practice, telling me which patients I should refer, telling me what conditions we can treat. Which is completely opposed to the Hippocratic Oath, isn't it? And it's not what uh, most medics came into medicine to do, was to look after their patient's best interest. We're in a unique position in this country for 65 years that has not contaminated the relationship. You know, when funds were restricted, we could say, look, we'll refer you for your hip replacement. You might have to wait a long while, but that's what you need. Well, the situation will be changing. We'll be having to tell people, we'll have to persuade them, this is not really what they need. We have to, end, we have to turn ourselves into a snake oil salesman for profiteers and corporations. And that, that's not a word I want to want to live in, really, Indeed. or practice in, yeah. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for being prepared to speak up. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.